back from it. Exactly what temperature that is, it's pretty much defined as like 115 degrees Fahrenheit or less, or, low, or higher, excuse me. Some people are strict and they say that even 110 and higher is considered Yatsu Redis, but in that range, above 115 is to show Yatsu Redis, but some say 113. You rinse the cleave with cold water or ambient temperature water, I mean not hot water because you don't want to cause an absorption. Let's say I have a meat dish here and I had a piece of cheesecake, cold. Clean, I mean, it's not a good thing to do, but if you did it and it's cold, there's no, it's still kosher. Now, how do I rinse off the meat plate? If I'm going to use hot water, I'm going to have the cheese absorbed into the plate, which I don't want to do. So I rinse it with cold water or ambient temperature. Be mindful of that. Of a lecham and a hot water, of a gamma mechem, what's the food source permissible? In Mishdamish, Bizak and Bizdar, not just even if somebody mistakenly used a meat knife to cut cheese. Well, how you shame saying them about them were cold? Bless you. Yeshlach, Shira, they need to be kakakasha as a palm. You can kasher it by stabbing it in un into untouched earth 10 times. That would make a great TikTok video, by the way. Jewish people going out in their yard, going like this, you know, this. You want to try it? No, is this like the idea that like come from Russian shtetls that like you can just bury your kitchen stuff in the backyard to cover it? You can cash your knife that way if it's only absorbed from cold stuff. You know, not hot. Hot needs fire or boiling water. But if you're talking about just cleaning the surface, the friction, the abrasion of going through that untouched earth would clean the blade. And by the way, the modern day equivalent is being in your kitchen by your sink and using steel wool. So same idea. It's also fine. I'm just saying if you want to. You don't have steel wool, or you don't want to spend your steel wool, you know, doing that. You can actually do that in the ground. However, if the food or the vessel was hot, it's a different story. Then, then it's more, then situationally, halachically, it's more strict. Then, or if you had dairy sitting pickling for twenty-four hours in a in a meat dish, meat vessel, for a period of 24 hours or more. Then you have to ask Shaila if the food is permissible to eat because there are different factors that come into play. Once you're dealing with heat or you're dealing with something that's settled for 24 hours, it's much more of an involved Shaila. But we didn't have to leave maybe the vessel also needs to be kosher. Yeish term, there are those that make mistakes. Sheev shalach shakol sakon at tzorach They think that you can kosher any knife that needs to be kosher. I feel the stomach by the mouth of Hamid if it was used for hot, I didn't need to be cocked. They think that if you haven't, let's say, for example, someone took a meat knife and they they cut hot cheese with it, they cut hot pizza. They think you can then take the knife, stab it into untouched earth, and cash it. It's not correct. This whole thing of stabbing the knife into untouched earth 10 times is only to remove what's on the blade, the residue on the blade of the knife, on the surface. But the kasha, what's absorbed inside the knife, you need to use either fire or boiling water, depending on how it was applied. I just want to clarify that. Any questions on what I said so far? Yeah. Um, I know we're talking about eating milk, but like if a non Jew used a hot water urn for only water and a Jew wants to never use it, could that be kasha with? Would that have to be captured with like the wet stone? So a hot water urn, it's really designed just to hold water. The only real shiloh with hot water urns would be, uh, do they wash it with trade for kalim? Or when they dispense the hot water for their coffee, if they had, let's say, non non-polyestral milk on the bottom of their coffee cup, they put in the milk before the hot water, and now you're just pouring hot water on it. You have what's called mitzvah where the pouring of the hot water will connect the milk in the mud straight up to a steam channel, so to speak. Those are the main questions that you have with the hot water urn. And as far as the washing of the hot water urn, it's really not likely that it was washed together with trade because it's a it's a unit for itself. So then I would recommend kashering the spout by having boiling water come out on the outside and pouring boiling water on the out. Uh, pour, let me say that, say that again. I was a tongue Having hot water coming from the inside, meaning, you know, basically uh, having hot water come out and pouring hot water, pouring hot water at the same time. So you're going to get maximum heat that way. And then it's on the outside. And that's how you pressure the spout and pull against it. I think that would be enough. Because hot water in is just for hot water. 
if it's a hot water, it's one of those things, those pour over, we have a pot, a pot itself is a little bit different because that does get washed with all the kalim. Then it's a question of whether, how it was washed, then it would need maybe possibly full kashari. Okay, the sink in the kitchen. Now, Mr. Shem, when we get married, you get married, a lot of times, the, at least the first apartment you move into will have uh, like just one sink. So you have you have this situation very much. How do you handle one sink if you have flesic the milk and uh, do that, etc.? So if you have the luxury of having more than one sink, it's great. It's not required, though. Halakhically, you could navigate the use of one sink. As long as you know what you're doing, it does require a little bit more effort. Most young couples start off with one sink. Now, if you have one sink, you shouldn't use that one sink to wash meat and dairy dishes, both of them sitting in the sink, because the sink really takes on the status of trade if it's used like that. So the question is how to do it. You have to wash, you have to be able to wash dairy vessels in there and also meat vessels in there. So you need to be able to have that functionality, that usage. How do you do that? We have three options. We have, we have a smorgasbord of options. One option is never to put down any, any vessels or any pots, plates, or even silverware on the, in the sink itself. Just hold it in your hand. Women don't like doing that. So they'll give the job to their husbands. Or you wear gloves. That's one option. It's an option. Or you can get these tubs. They have these like inserts that go into the sink. And then you can put your meat dishes inside this tub. So a certain color just for meat. Let's say it's going to be the red tub. That's, what, that's the color we're going to designate for meat. And we're going to have a blue tub for the dairy. Very nice. Now, still, because these tubs would be sitting on the floor of the sink itself, so it's still proper to create a barrier between the tub and the sink itself, because the sink itself is trafe. And you have hot liquid and you have you know liquidity there, so you want to create a little barrier. So it's proper, it's proper to put down some sort of a rack to give you a little bit of elevation so that the tub is not directly sitting on the floor of the sink. They make these dish racks that are a little bit elevated. They, they, they have these, they're kind of like a little bit of a mouth, like one inch mountain, it goes flat, and you put your tub on top of that. You have one for dairy, one for meat, again, you know, color coordinated. That's the second option. Or you can take the same kind of racks without the tub, right? And one is going to be for meat, one is going to be for dairy. And when you're going to wash your meat dishes, you put down the meat rack. And then you're going to put down the dairy rack when you're going to wash your dairy dishes. All fine and good. Now, it's important to note that when you get these racks, they should be slightly elevated off the floor of the sink. They shouldn't be like a flat mat. It should be elevated. So again, your dishes are not touching the sink itself. And also, in order that the dishes don't touch the bottom of the sink, and also one should be careful. So to make sure the sink doesn't back up, so it's not going to create a problem with your dishes. And also try to be mindful that the dishes should not touch the walls of the sink either, because the sink is traced. So you can do it carefully. Um, and that's that. Yeah, okay. Any questions? Yeah. That's an option when you have the tub insert. You could just have one rack and like two different types of. You should have two different racks, preferably. What if you touch it like the corner or just the wall, but it's like you're washing in cold water? It wouldn't be a problem. Okay, so it's only a problem you... Yes, it's only a problem if you're washing with water that's too hot to touch, which is higher than a temperature of like 110 Fahrenheit, I would say. No, on, on the 15, um, if you're washing with gloves, it might be too hot to touch. Now, another thing you can do is you can set the, um, I don't know if there, it has, a, I'm not sure if such a thing exists under the sink. 
can definitely set the hot water tank. If you're living in a building, you have no control over this, but in a house, you can set the hot water tank not to give off water that's super hot. Too hot to touch. Not scold, no, it won't go give off scalding water. Depends what temperature you're gonna, you're gonna set it at, but there's just something to think about. But it, if let's say you have a housekeeper in the house that washes dishes and she made a mistake. If she's not wearing gloves, right? She's washing with a bare hand. That means the water is not too hot to touch because otherwise she'd be screaming. So then the Yevid, we would say, okay, it was a mistake. It wasn't good, but it doesn't make a trace because it's not too hot to touch. So that's the thing. Okay. Thus concludes the halakh of the bus of the Any questions? Yeah. The, the, the third option is similar to the second option, but the difference is that the third option is saying you can do it without the tub. You won't have the tub. You're just going to have the rack. The downside of the third option is that you have to be a little more careful that, that, the, that the pots are not going to, the dishes are not going to touch the side of the sink. The tub is in a, like a protected environment. So the tub is more secure of a method. But technically, you're allowed to do option three if you're careful. It's not going to touch the side of the sidewalk with the sink. Yeah. Could you also, like, if you're careful with the water, could you choose, like, oh, this thing is mostly for me. We do the milk once a month, so we'll do that at its tub and serve for the milk. Or could you just cost it in between? That could work if you're not using it with hot water. Mm -hmm. What? I always use hot water. Yeah, that wouldn't work otherwise. And, and it's not recommended to cost in between because we don't set up a system. We're going to have to keep caution back and forth because we don't come to make a mistake. So that wouldn't work. So it seems like you need a rack. Like, what happens if the water in the thing like backs up above the rack? So then we get into other questions. Was it uh, was it full of soap? How hot the water was? It creates questions. What the answer will be will depend on those details. Okay. Yeah. Um. In the event that like you have kosher cat food but someone accidentally puts the cat plate into the sink and you're not sure if it was a kosher cat food or the like not kosher cat food then they'll have to food it then they'll have to food it was when you wash it or soap would use soap would also make it puzzle and make it not palatable so if the soap was introduced before any hot water again after the fact for the avid that would also be a one of the possibilities to be able to permit the thing but um, we're talking about how to set it up properly on set and how to be cautious. And then when a question arises, we can ask the question there. Okay, now we're going to segue, move on to the next subject. We're going to skip the laws of salting, who, <clears throat> which is Hilchos Malicha, and we're going to move on to the halakhas of Pas Akum. Um, for those of you that have been to my house, know that Artistic abilities, artistic talent was given to my wife. I was sleeping, I was taking a nap. And that happens. I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on I'm drawing a diagram on the board. But anyway, um, I only do that when I really have to. So I know my place. Anyway, um we're starting a whole new subject now. The laws of my holy akum, foods that are prepared and cooked, baked, milked in the case of milk, by a non-Jew. Let me just give a little introduction. I'm going to turn up a moment. A little introduction on this subject. It's very different than what we've heard until now. The laws of Bas Bukhala are laws that pertain. Laura says that we're not allowed to mix milk and meat together. So we spoke about all the details, how we have to have the segregation and how we have to have the waiting period and the dishes, the whole, the whole nine yards, right? And all that. Fine. But now, that was something that Bas Bukhala was clearly written in the Torah in the Chumash. It's looking, written three times to teach us you know how to cook, you know how to have benefit, and you're not allowed to eat. Got it. Now, the next subject is totally different in nature. I'm going to just spend a few moments giving you a little bit of a picture so that as we study and dive into it, you'll be able to, to relate to it better. So we're talking about an Issa de Rabban, we're talking about a rabbinic prohibition. Whenever we talk about something that's rabbinically prohibited, the rabbi set a structure. The rabbis defined it and said, okay, the following things are of concern, which by definition means other things are not of concern. So they set the parameters for what the problems are. And in those parameters, they're going to say, these are the parameters of what's of concern, and other things are not going to be of concern. Now, there is a, a certain similarity to the laws of Pasach and bread baked by a non Jew and food cooked by a non Jew, but there are also similar, there are also certain differences. So, 
on um, on a global level, if you will, I'm just using some poetic terms. On a global level, the the structure of the prohibition of pasachim and bishulachim have similar qualities to them. The rabbis, the main reason why the rabbis instituted this prohibition is because they want to prevent intermarriage between the Jew and the non-Jew. There's a fascinating book by Rabbi Zalman Posner of blessed memory called Think Jewish. I recommend it for those of you that like to read. It's, it's a easy read, maybe 100 pages. Um, and in that book, he talks about different types of cuisine. You have know, Mexican cuisine, you have Italian cuisine, you have Mediterranean cuisine, you have Russian cuisine. Right? And each one of these countries have their culture, they have their famous recipes, right? What would be if someone decides one day to wake up and create a new cuisine? We'll take Italian cuisine, Mediterranean cuisine, uh, Russian cuisine, and uh, and mix it together with one big cholin. It's not going to go over too well. Same thing with intermarriage. Each nation is special unto themselves. The Jewish nation have a special mission in the world. And the non-Jewish nation have, have their special mission in the world. And mixing the cuisines together spoil both cuisines. So it's a disservice also to the non Jewish nation, intermarriage is, is a disservice to them as well. That's how he illustrates the point. Now, so the main reason why the rabbis made this prohibition is in order to prevent intermarriage. There's a fascinating story. There was a, an initiative by non Lubavitch Rabbonin in order to, to help curb the, the tide of intermarriage on college campuses. And they were they came up with this initiative, they're going to send speakers to speak to the Jewish students, you know, et cetera. And they, they had, one of them was had a connection with the Rebbe, and they asked the Rebbe. The Rebbe said, establish kosher cafeterias on, on campus. Based on these unlockers, because when you eat together, eating together causes mingling. So if the Jewish boys and Jewish girls on campus are going to eat together, so they'll marry each other. When, they'll, they'll find a Jewish mate, which is which, what, what we want. So, so basically what the Chazal, the rabbis are telling us is that the power of, of eating of food preparation and that kind of a setting creates almost like nuclear energy, very, very powerful energy. We have to make sure we use that energy and harness it in a Torah fashion. Just to give another example, you speak to Shluchim, when they invite people over who are new to, the, to their experience in Yiddishkeit, they come to a Friday night meal, they come to a Shabbos meal, they see the aura, they have the experience, it can have a more profound effect on them than actually sitting by a, by a lecture and study. Because it, it's a really like a soulful type of effect. So the rabbis are saying that the power, the energy, and the, the type of um, experience it is when, when people eat together or prepare food is very strong. And the rabbis said there has to be certain guidelines of how that should be done so as to prevent intermarriage. Yes. You've heard the story where when you to the rabbi about um, the business, and the rabbi suggested that he open up the Khan Heights for that Jewish, like, boys and girls. But not kind of like the world, but that Jewish boys and girls should um, marry each other. And he was saying, I want that in writing. It happened like a representative person. He's like, I want this in writing because people are going to go against me. He wrote to the Reverend and said, Can you please, like, just I want it in writing what you said to me when we met the other day. And he said, Chas Bashan, like, this is against Shulchanara. To have like people mixing. But it wasn't in, on college campus, it was like somewhere else in a community and from community. Right. Right. I don't know the story, but there's two points here. There's Jews have to marry each other. Should the boys and girls be mingling not for the sake of marriage? No. But but it doesn't mean they shouldn't marry each other. Jewish boys and girls have to marry each other. So so both points are true. And there were certain things that the Rebbe told people uh, to do, but, but privately. Because optically they wouldn't necessarily be understood that. Way. So there was such things, like there was a story with an aid of there was a rubble came up with this idea to make an air in Manhattan and a whole the Rebbe said make the air, but don't tell anybody. So it was it was a questionable air. It was a point of only one opinion. The Rebbe says for those that are carrying, we can say, okay, they, they have an air, they have this opinion to rely on, but for people that are not going to carry, they shouldn't rely on it. So you know, in order to be able to, to navigate that. Okay, so back to our subject matter. So this is this is what we're talking about now, just to be clear. But the actual structure of what is prohibited in the in the field of Pasakum. Versus the field of Bishalakim are different. So what I want you to, I just want to stress again is that the the global on the global level, the reason for the prohibition as it brought down the Gemara and the is in order. The primary reason is to prevent intermarriage, to prevent chasmas between the umis between 
the Jewish nation and the non-Jewish nation, prevent intermarriage. But the structure of what's prohibited with regards to Pasach and what's regards what's prohibited regarding Bishalakum is different because there are different types of foods and there's different they have different natures to them. Okay. There's a secondary reason, by the way, which is When it comes to cooked foods, a non-Jew is going to cook the food from us or beginning to end. Then and they don't they don't keep the laws of kosher. Maybe they'll mix in something that's not kosher into the mix. Yes, if there's no oversight, just another another. That's a secondary reason. Now, if you get into a fascinating discussion, what about if you have a Jew who's not religious? Happens then they're Jewish. So a non-religious Jew is a lot of marry a religious Jew. Right? It's a complicated marriage, but permits both Jewish law, right? So you can't say that the reason, oh, a non-Jewish, a non-religious person is not allowed to turn on the fire, make the bread passi throw, or make the food visually throw, because of intermarriage, because there's no concern of intermarriage here. As the expression goes in Yiddish, that kosher pod, a kosher spoon, you've got to go, no problem. Mm -hmm. So what are you worried about? So what about the reason about maybe mixing in something not kosher? So if someone doesn't keep kosher, then there is a concern. Maybe they're not going to know, and they may, a mix-up could, could ensue. So according to that reason, it would be, there would be a, a reason to say it should be a religious person. So there are different views on it. If a person's in a situation where it can only be a religious person turning on the fire, that's obviously better. But under certain circumstances where it's like a sensitive situation, there is room to be lenient in that regard. Okay, let's look at inside. Uh, the preface to the laws of foods that are cooked by an Anju. Until, we, until now we spoke about one page, by the way, 52. If I'm speaking too quickly, let me know. I've got a speeding ticket. I tend to do that. Um, just a funny story to share with you. I have a nephew who speaks two times faster than I do. Yeah. So I was teaching a few years ago, and other girls asked me to slow down. I said, by the way, oh, yeah, that's the nephew who speaks, you know, and he even had to learn how to slow down. <laughs> And his nephew on the other side of the family, his uncle was watching the class and he took the clip, he screenshotted it, sent it to my nephew. <laughs> my nephew sent it back to me. Thanks for the thanks for the shout out. I didn't say his name, but it was very funny. I was a little embarrassed. I have to be careful what I say. Um, anyway, um, there are some prohibitions that are prohibited rabbinically. This is rabbinic in nature, so we have to just tune into that. That's the structure now. The heim pasakum, they are bread baked by a non Jew, three different categories here. Bishalakum, foods cooked by a non Jew, and chal of shalakum, milk that's milked by a non Jew, actually four categories, five, I should say. Givina sakum, cheese that's made by a non Jew, and stam yenum is referring to wine from a non Jew. Yesh mehem on the sasim al kashashis There are some of these prohibitions that are based on a direct concern from the Torah. Like Kalavakum. Kalavakum, the concern is if there's no Jew watching the milking, maybe the non Jew would mix in milk from a non kosher animal. So that's where the non kosher, the concern from the Torah is immediate. Not that something else can develop. So it's it's a it's a more severe type of rabbinic prohibition because it's directly linked up to a concern from the Torah. Green Asakum, the same would be with Green Asakum, we're worried that maybe they're going to put in the rennet from a non kosher animal. Which would be a problem from the Torah. Some of them are rabbinic prohibition, like the case of Hasakum and Bishul Akum. It's it's purely rabbinic prohibition. There's no immediate concern that the food would be awesome in a Torah. The concern is that they might develop a relationship and then come to Mr. Torah. But the, the concern about the intermarriage is a secondary thing. They're going to first have to mingle and get together, etc. Yeah. Page 52, moon base. Moon base? Moon base, yeah. And now we're going to quote in, in Halakha Bays. This is, this, is, this is a Hakdama, an introduction to these laws. In Halakha Bays, we're going to quote the Rambam. The Rambam puts it very succinctly in chapter 17 of the laws of Mycholos source of prohibited foods, Halakha tests. Yesham Devorim Achet and the other things, also and Chacham, the rabbis prohibited. Even though they don't have a, an actual face from the Torah, the rabbis made this prohibition in order that we should be distant from the non-Jews. 
until the point where Jews should not mingle with them. We have really this chasnas that come to intermarriage. Any questions so far? Just wondering how this is going to apply with like the OU certification of the you know, most recent. It doesn't really apply, but like my neighbor was really good, you know. Right. So we're going to discuss that as we get into the subject. We're going to learn that when it comes to Pas Yisrael, there was a prohibition, but because it was something that was not accepted unanimously upon all Jewish communities at the time of the enactment, in a place where someone cannot easily get Pas Yisrael, non pas Yisrael kosher bread is permissible to consume, even though we as Hasidim are strict to only eat Pas Yisrael. And all Jews are supposed to be strict to only have Pas Yisrael during Aser Simei between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The Holy Torah says, so regarding the Jewish nation, again, I'm referencing the book from Rabbi Zalman Posner, Blessed Memory, being Jewish, so recommended reading. In Am Levod the Dishkoin, it might actually be downstairs in the library. I don't know, it very possibly could be there. In Am Levod the Dishkoin, if I go in the the Jewish people dwell in solitude and they don't, they're not reckoned with the non Jew, which means what? The Jews are meant to be a nation for unto themselves. They're not supposed to mingle with non-Jews. In fact, there are many stories when Jews try to mingle too much with non-Jews, and non-Jews remind them of the Jewish name because they feel uncomfortable because it's not their God-given mandate. That's their purpose, to be separate. The Jewish people can achieve their God-given mandate and their wholesomeness when they become pleased with God and separate from the nations, then they can do their, their mission. Since the Jewish people are a holy nation and a kingdom of priests, the job is to spread light throughout the whole world. I'll make you a light unto the nations. It's from Yeshayahu. Yeshayahu. As long as the, the Jewish people are cleaving to the non Jewish nation, so not only is there a loss where they're not going to be given, not going to be giving spiritual vitality to non Jews, they're actually going to be influenced. Mingling with the non Jews, you want to start to be, to be like them. And, and a Jew has to be different because they were given the Torah. And then what will eventually happen is that the, the Jewish men would take non Jewish women as wives, and come to idol worship, and create a destructive force in Jewish life, which is intermarriage. You shouldn't marry them. Your daughter should, give to, should not give to their son. And your daughter shouldn't take. I'm sorry, their, their, their daughter shouldn't take for your son. When your son turns away from me, there's idol worships. Hashem of him, Hashem's wrath will be shown upon them. So it's a very strong uh, force. Intermarriage is a very, very strong concern. And basically, what happens is. Um, when a person starts to not act and not, not cultivate and live with their Jewishness, there's a loss that's felt on both sides of the aisle. By the non-Jewish people, is a loss because they're not benefiting from the light that the Jew is supposed to shine onto the world. And, and not only that, but the Jew is being schlepped into things that he's not supposed to be, he or she are not supposed to be involved with. So, Nimtza Dalit, which kind of tidy, summarizes everything in, in one tidy bundle, the mingling of the Jews to the Umais, to the nations, is damaging to the Jewish nation and to the non Jewish nation. It's a damaging thing to both. To the, to the non Jews themselves, they're going to be missing those light posts, the guideposts 
them and we're going to guide them and we're going to guide them and illuminate the way the ways of God for them. I remember my father told me, my father blessed and remember he told me that when he, he was in the Chivas with the Rebbe in 1965, if I, I believe it was, 66, um, the Rebbe told him to be very careful to give your bosses an honest day's work. My father was a scientist. The chief operating scientist for over 20 years. He's a famous scientist. And all the non-Jews are just looked at all the non-Jews are going to look at you. See what a Jew is. Be very careful to give them an honest day's work. My father used to always work extra for the about two hours or coming on, on legal holidays in order to be careful about that. But because they look at you and, and, and he was he actually served in that capacity. He uh a lot of the non-Jews. You know, he, he had he interacted with a lot of non-Jews, well, not too many Jews in the company. And uh, he was like a father figure to some of the young men there. They come to him with all their issues with their girlfriends and this and that, just trying to, you know, my father encouraged them to get married. They should marry non-Jews, they're non-Jewish people, but to get married, have a family, to like settle down. And uh, so he, he played a role of, of being a, a mentor to them. Um, okay, now. Yes. What you do is if you do business with someone non Jew. You're allowed, like to, you, you're allowed to do business with non Jews. It happens all the time. It's yeah. just the idea that the rabbi said there should be certain safeguards of interaction. So I have I have a lot of customers that are not Jewish. I interact with them all the time. But we interact with them under a certain setting, a business setting, a meeting, talk about things. But we don't socialize with them just casually for no reason. We might socialize for a minute just to see what's happening. We'll say hello before the minute this is being starts, but we don't really socialize per se. So I'll get, I'll get, I'll answer you with another story. My father told me when they, when he was in the company, they'd have these holiday parties. He told me it's a New Year's party. And if he wouldn't go, it would be like a snub to what to do. So he, I mean, it was not a, you know, food was a kosher. He couldn't even partake in it anyway. But even so, going to a party was problematic because you're not supposed to mingle. So he asked the I think he must have asked the Rav what to do. My father was a magician, an amateur magician, but he was pretty good. So what he did was he would do, he would do a magic show every time he had a party. He would do the magic show first thing. I would look at the opening of the party, he would do the magic show. He'd just say hello to everybody, then he would leave. So this way he didn't snub anybody, but he wasn't socializing. So that has to be something you have to recommend. A, a colleague of mine told me a fascinating thing. And it's, it is an issue, by the way, everyone grapples with. He said to me that if, when you start talking to the clients, this, the minute they start telling you off-color jokes, you know that you're, 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 you're entering into dangerous territory. It's getting thrown too far. So it's a fine line where you to be friendly with them. You know, you say, how's the family? But you also have to make sure that you're keeping a, a certain distance and a certain uh, a stature, so to speak. What do you mean by off-color jokes? No, I'm not talking about Jews. If they if they tell you jokes that are not so nice or something like that, you know, it's getting a little too, uh, yeah, yeah. What if they're Jews that are doing that? That's another issue. <laughs> it's also an issue, but it's not an issue of, of mingling with Jews to Jews. You can just tell them it's not appropriate. Someone's going to have to do that. Um, or if I tell a joke to a client, I always tell them I'm only telling you kosher jokes. They don't, you know, people shouldn't go into their own territory. But but it's a balance. It's really a balance about getting. Uh, but it's also an opportunity to inspire people. There have been times when uh, uh, I have a client of mine, one of my mashkichim met somebody. Uh, I think it was I'm trying to remember, all the, I don't remember all the details, but he met someone in a factory. It was a non Jewish woman. She was going through a very difficult time in life. She was like almost suicidal. And he helped her, like he put her in touch with somebody and she was able to, so if you see something, you have to react to it, but in a Torah fashion, that's the idea. I think he put this woman in touch with his wife and she helped her, like, you know, get some help or something like that. Okay, Allah hey. Al Kain, Tava Kadesh Baruch Hashem made the nature, Betchunas Umas Ha'elam, the non-Jewish nation, Shainam Soivim Kirvasenu. They don't really tolerate our we want to get too close to them. Relationships are okay in the right context, but too close, they don't. If they start being like them, they remind us of our Jewishness. It's like when you go to Mitzayim, you know, are you Jewish? So the Jewish guy doesn't say anything. 
my front home is not Jewish friends. Oh yeah, he's Jewish. Yeah, I know he's Jewish. So to remind him of the Jewishness. Like you try to sell your soul, no one wants to buy it because they know you're Jewish. Such a thing where the Jews try to be like the non-Jewish nation. It's not going to be able to be like that forever. It wouldn't, wouldn't survive the test of time. The nature won't, won't be able to tolerate that because there's no need for such a thing because that's not the way God designed the world. They need the Jewish people to be pure in their in the true fashion. I'll tell you another story. I was at a, I was at a, a food show once. There was a Hasidish woman. She was working for one of the bakeries, a large bakery. There's a non-Jewish fellow who came to the booth and wants to do business with them. So thinking of buying the product, I don't know what the details were. So at the end of the meeting, the discussion, the non-Jew didn't know he offered his hand to shake her hand, to say goodbye. He said, I'm sorry, I cannot shake hands out of, out of modesty. So he asked her for more, he didn't know anything about it. He asked her for more explanation. She said that, uh, that she can only have physical contact with her husband, with her father, her grandfather, her sons. But only only immediate blood relatives like that. We cannot obey the old mother. And he was so impressed with her integrity, and he doctor wanted to do business with them because of that. <laughs> he said, Oh, they have they stand for something, what I want to have. <laughs> so if we come too close, it pushes aside. Ever since we went to exile, that's what has happened. Anytime the walls have been broken down, or we got too close to the non-Jewish nation, the non-Jews didn't really want us to be that close. The degree that we forgot the differences, that's how much the non-Jews reminded us. So that's what has happened in, in society. Now, the last halacha gets into the power of food. First of all, by the, way, by the way, it's obvious. We all know this. Every Jewish holiday, except for Kippur, of course, but it's connected with food, right? Purim, the way you wanted to kill us, let's eat. Uh, Hanukkah, they wanted to kill our soul, to take, take our neshama, you yeah, eat the latkes. And Pesach, you have the matzah. Every holiday has got their foods. So food is very powerful. It has like it's it's very symbolic and it carries a lot of meaning. The beginning of closeness of people starts when they eat together when they have some food together. It draws the hearts. It can bring them to intermarriage. The circle of Israel and to and to come to idol worship. You can eat from their offerings. You can take from their daughters to your son. And then your daughters go after their gods. And then your son will go after their gods. Again, bring the idol worship. That's why the rabbis made this prohibition, rabbinic prohibition, that the Jewish people should be separate from the non-Jews with regards to their foods and their drinks. There should be certain gedarim, certain boundaries, certain parameters. Shouldn't eat their foods and drink their drinks. Even even when they're even when they're kosher. While them, why they mashenet so long they're chomim machol. Since we're not allowed to eat from their foods, yeah, I mean, I'm nimno. Should not be this carving of olayim is not them. So we're going to eventually. So that's going to stop us from getting too close to them and to intermarry them. If regular wine, <coughs> meaning not wine that was used for idolatrous purposes, regular non kosher wine, non Jewish wine, excuse me, it was already us, if it was already prohibited in the times of Pinchas, which is in the times of the Chomish, at that time it was not yet prohibited. The Jews would not have stumbled to the daughters of Midian and the Baal Par. Only to the mother, so that it explains only through them drinking the non kosher wine did they come to this sin. The prophet, my boy, Miss Barry, is through the past. And the upcoming studies, 
we're going to study the laws. The next one's going to be about Pasakam, bread baked by a non Jew, and Bishalakam refers to foods that are cooked by a non Jew. That's the introduction to these studies. Any questions? Okay. Now I'll tell you a story because we only have two minutes anyway to learn on any subject. So this past week, this past week, there was a year in Boston. I, I grew up in Boston. If I ever grew up, it's another question. I grew up in Boston. Um, and we, there was a time that ever said every city has to have a mashpia. So there was a year, his name was Rabbi Meshach Gorkov. He was the mashpia of the town. Right, I see you. So when I was a young boy, 18, 17, a teenager, I got the scene in action. He passed away last week at age 90 to share a story or two with him about him. He was, uh, he was buckled to the Rebbe, meaning he was totally subservient to the Rebbe with his heart and soul, with every fiber of his being. We went on a seat of snippets for the Rebbe at all times. And money was no issue. Didn't have money, didn't have income. And he just mm -hmm. did it with it. Anyway, so when there'd be a Yutzes Kislev to bring him, or Yutz Shvat to bring him, I would drive in from the, I'd get a ride from Boston to New York with him. And then I remember at the time he had a very big station wagon. Before the minivan age, and these very like nine seater station wagons that would gas up us. You drive in, and after the Tabrang, if you go over like one or two o'clock in the morning, you have to fill up with gas again because they took so much gas, you have to fill up. You wouldn't be able to go back and forth on one thing, it's such a big part. So the devil would finish off every Tabrang around the Shia coming any moment. So he would he'd fill up with gas and he'd say, Whatever, it's just sad yeah. that Atta comes from a Shia, Shia is coming. Because I'll pay by credit card. By the time the bill comes, Mashiach will be here for already a long time already. I won't have to worry about it. That's what you'd say every time. And um, he, he was a, he was on fire. His thoughts was on fire. He was, and in, in, the, in the beginning, like in the 1940s, the 50s, he did release time. He would bring kids from the public schools, Eastern Taita, and they thought the conservative movement and the reform movement thought that there was a some rabbi. The Gurkhov has this massive institution. Tons of money. All he was was just a rabbi with a man who would just collect kids and keep them tied up. An incredible human being. Um, tremendous mystery that's not just what happened. And um, I once, I just one more story, this is a vivid story in my mind. At, when I was about 18 years old, there was a problem in Cookies in, uh, in Boston. God bless me, thank God, but uh, a good memory. I remember this vividly. It was a Fabrengan, the house of Rabbi Moshe Rahmani. He's one of the people that he really turned him into a Babshir. Sardi made him into a Babshir. Rabbi Rabbi Gurkha, he was a till one, two o'clock in the morning. Someone had to walk Rabbi Gurkha home because he was already intoxicated. So I was given the honor of doing that. I had to walk him for 15 minutes from this house to his house at like one o'clock in the morning in, in Brighton area. A lot of college kids. Rabbi Gurkha was screaming at the top of his lungs, he's stuck in jail. The world doesn't exist. Well, only godliness exists. So I saw, I was watching the shades, the window shades of the streets are opening up and peeking out. What's going on over here? You know, he's going on. A, then we're crossing this very large street, like like Eastern Parkway, or Commonwealth Avenue, for those that are familiar with Boston. He goes, okay, this is going to be really interesting. Because I've got to get this man across like five lanes, you know what I mean? And so it, as soon as it turns green, I'm, you know, robustly holding his arm and getting him across. And then we're almost finished crossing the street. And then there's this sports car staying at the red light, the Camaro. I don't know if I the car, I remember the car was a red Camaro. And he stops by the car. He's going, he's talking about, he's talking about. I'm thinking, this, this is like out of world. Like, this driver probably has seen an angel going like this. That's what it was. That was my show. Because he made it to the MS. And uh, he did a lot for the, uh, the school. And, uh, Anyway, lots of stories to tell. But anyway, just want to be a real place in Shalom. Have a wonderful Shabbos. And uh, Mitzvah Shem will continue. Kadima.